You were blessed. All right, well, we're going to jump in today. Uh, anybody watching online, welcome to Grassroots. I'm super excited. We're in the book of Luke. We're going to keep going. I have a special guest here tonight, or today, is my dad. This is uh, pa Pastor Ron, um, Captain Ron, whatever you want to call him. He's going to jump in uh, at the end here, and, and I'm going to ask him some questions because today we're going to talk about growing faith. We want to have big faith. How many of you guys want to have big faith? We talk about that, right? Like, we want to be people of big faith. We don't want to be, uh, you, know, you know, believers that have faith for nothing because then what's different between us and, and the rest of the world, right? Um, we, we should be the example. People should, outside of the church should look to the church and see big faith, at least I think. They should see people that, that are reading, you know, the, the, the Word of God and putting it to work. Um, not just, you know, talking about it, not just, you know, sometimes we just get in this mode where we want to study it and understand it, and we feel really good about that, right? We feel like, okay, good, I, I have all this knowledge, I feel like I'm a Christian, but if you look at the lives of the disciples, like, they weren't really stopping and just studying anything. Like, they were doing life with Jesus, and he was, you know, was he teaching them? Yes. But where was he teaching them? He was teaching them on the move, right? They're going from place to place, and they're watching him uh, do miracles, cast out devils, you know, and, and, and teach all this really cool stuff. And then, you know, of course, at the end of the story, which, which we're not there in Luke yet, we'll be there later, but, you know, he sends them out to go and, and impact and change the world. And that's why we're here today, right? It's because these, these men and women of God went out and they spread the, the, the gospel. And, and there was, you know, signs and wonders. And there was just like this crazy movement that, is, that was unstoppable. No matter how badly the people of that time, you know, the Pharisees wanted to stop this movement, they couldn't do it. And so against all odds, these people were able to change the world. And that's because... They, they, didn't, they didn't just study, they actually went out, they believed, and they did something about it. And God showed up. So, Father, we thank you for, uh, for the gospel of Luke. Lord, we, we thank you that you've called us to more than, than to just study and be smart. <laughs> and so, Lord, we, um, God, we, just, we, we really do thank you for that, that you have chosen us uh, to be a part of your mission that is... A very active mission. We thank you for Jack in the back that he's able to shout out a hallelujah. And uh, so, Father God, we, we just thank you this morning, and we ask you to bless this time. So, amen. All right, so I'm going to read a story. I'm going to go through this. Um, I'm going to do like about like half a sermon, and then I'm going to bring my dad up here, and, and I'm going to ask him some questions. So here we go. We're in Luke chapter 9. We finally made it to chapter 9. Hooray. We've been doing this for almost a year. And we're almost, we're in chapter 9. It's a big deal. It takes a while. <laughs> but it's been good. So chapter 9, verse 1 through 8, it says, Now he called the twelve together and gave them power and, and authority over all the demons and the power, the power to heal diseases. I have my biggest fan in the back, as you can tell. He's like, preach it, Dad. I'm only reading. <laughs> but thank you for the encouragement. Uh, the power, he gave him power to heal diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not even have two tunics, which I think is a coat, coat, tunics, jacket of some sort, no, shirt, <laughs> shirt. So one shirt, can you imagine that? I have a new shirt for every day. I mean, not a brand new one, but a clean one. Um, and he says, in whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for all who did not receive you, when you leave that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And as they were leaving, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed because he had said, it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old has risen. So we're not going to focus on, on that whole piece there. Apparently there's you know, all these miracles happening, and there's these rumors going around that weren't true. But what I want to focus on this story is, is two things today. Number one, that Jesus 
sent them out, right? He's been demonstrating to them the whole time, like he's been casting out demons, healing the sick, you know, proclaiming the kingdom. Like they've been watching him do this the whole time. And now he's saying, okay, it's time for you to go try this stuff. And, and, and I love it because he didn't go with them. You know, and I, I had a question when we were kind of studying this scripture. It's like, I wonder what Jesus was doing. You know, like, was he just hanging out somewhere, having, like, some coffee, you know, waiting for these guys to come back? Because they're traveling on foot, right? So it's not like this was, like, a couple days. They were gone for a while, and they were without Jesus. So this is literally that moment where it's like when you're a kid, and your dad takes off the training wheels off your bike, and he's like, okay, you tried it with me. Now you're going to go try it on your own. And I think that unless you don't know how to ride a bike, everybody remembers that, right? Like, you remember... That first time, you might have crashed and, and skinned your knee or, or whatever. I crashed my bike even when I knew how to ride it. So, you know, it's, it's just doing boy stuff. <laughs> Been over the handlebars a couple times. Anyway, but this is that moment that Jesus is sending them out to go do stuff. But what's really interesting is, like, that he doesn't make it easy. It doesn't seem like it, right? Like, He's not like, hey, go pack your lunch boxes, you know, like get all your clothes together, you know, get a suitcase. You guys are probably going to be gone for a while. No, he's like, don't take anything. You're going to go out. I'm giving you power. You're going to cast out the, the demons. You're going to heal the sick. You're going to proclaim the kingdom, but you're going to have no supplies. And that's what I want to talk about today, because we're going we're gonna to get, I'm going to bring my dad up, and we're going to talk about the, the miracles and, and, and the bigger stuff. But to get there, I want to just talk about this idea of, like, why did Jesus ask them to take nothing? And so I'm just going to propose what I believe is the reason, and, and maybe you've heard a different reason, but this is just, as I was talking to God, this is what stood out to me, is that everything that Jesus was asking them to do on this journey was going to require faith. Right? So if you're going out to, you know, cast out demons and, you know, heal the sick, that's going to take some big faith. Would you agree? And so I think that Jesus wanted to, bait, he wanted to prime the, 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 the pump of faith before they even left. He said, you know what, you guys are going to have to already have cultivated this mindset of faith within yourself, this culture of faith within yourself to do any of this stuff. So guess what? Here's where we're going to start. Take nothing. And to even step out on this journey, it required faith. Like, how many of you guys, if I said, hey, look, you're walking to Portland today, like, take nothing, you're going to proclaim the kingdom, and, and you're going to heal the sick, cast out demons, how many of you guys would be like, I don't know, Nick, like, I don't that, that sounds pretty bad, right? I mean, it, it would take a lot of faith to, and I'm, don't, don't, I'm not asking you to do that, you know, but, but if Jesus was here asking you to do that, right? It's like you have to look at this guy and say, okay, <laughs> you know, like we've seen you do some pretty cool stuff, so we're going to actually trust you on this mission. And, and I think it's just, it, again, it just comes to literally he's priming the pump, right? He's, he's saying, listen, if you want to do greater works, you at least have to have a baseline of faith to start from. You got to at least be able to, to believe that God can provide for you. Because if we struggle even believing that in, for God's provision, like how much more are we going to struggle when it comes to going and praying for the sick or casting out a demon, you know, or proclaiming the kingdom? I mean, it, check that out. I mean, even proclaiming the kingdom, if we can't even like honestly believe that in this kingdom God provides for his kids, like how am I going to go out and proclaim this kingdom with authority if I don't even have faith for my, my provision? And so I just think, and I just wonder if, like, maybe this was Jesus' thinking. is like, no, it, for the believer to actually do the greater works, they need to at least have a baseline of faith. Like, we need to at least all start in this place where we believe that all of our security, all of our provision, all of our purpose, all of our hope, all of our everything, even the air I breathe, is provided to me from, from the Father. And... And I, I get it that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easier kind of said than done because we live in a, a nation, right, that is, is, you know, is prosperous. And it's easy for us to start to, instead of having faith, you know, in, in God for this stuff, we have faith in, in systems. We have faith in science. It's medicine. You know, I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm just saying, like, we got, if, if we don't recognize, like, like, where these things even come from first, 
we, we, we're kind of got a problem. You know, we have faith in our retirement plans. Our security is all found in these worldly systems. But the truth is, is that anything the world gives you can be taken away like that. The only provision that, that is going to last is, is kingdom provision. And, and that's just the way it is. You know, when, when you know, my dad is going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the experience he's had. And I, I, and I know a lot of my dad's story is my dad was a missionary in Mexico for a lot of years. And so he might share some stories from, from there or, or maybe not. I'm not really sure. But here's what I know, you know, is that people who go on missions to third world countries, they always come back and they, they're like, oh, my gosh, we saw miracles like crazy. And, and I just, I have, I just want to propose that possibly one of the reasons that is, is, is number one, when people go out on mission, they already have primed that faith of pump, that, that, that pump faith. They have a baseline, right? If you go on a mission, you're already excited. You're already like, you're challenging all your faith, you're stirring it up, and you're getting excited to go out and see God do miraculous things. So you already leave in a mindset of, of, of faith. And then the other side of that, too, is that the people that you're going to see, especially in a third world country, a lot of them have no other option but God showing up in power. So you have like this collision of faith happening. You have somebody of faith that's stirred up, ready, and going out, and then you're meeting somebody who's like, man, I only have, only have God. He's my only option. And, and even though that's, you know, a, a byproduct of, of usually like poverty and stuff like that, which obviously isn't, you know, a, a fun way to live, I'm sure. Um, and to remember that as Americans, like we're even the poorest of us are richer than, you know, a lot of people. So we don't really have an understanding of what it, it's like to live in, in poverty as, as some people. And, and I'm, I don't know everybody's story, but I, you know, there's some situations that are just rough, right? But, but the, you know, the, the thing is, is like when you're in those situations and, and you have, I heard a guy say once, it's like when God is my only option, he's like, that seems rough, but he said it's like a blessing because I'm not turning to all the other things anymore. Like my faith is just in God. Like if you don't show up and do something in my life right now, man, I'm in trouble. And I'm just wondering, like, how is it that we can, as Americans, that are living in a prosper, prosperous country, how can we shift our mindset to that mindset while we have options? Like, I, I got to believe it's possible that we can live in this way where we're like, you know what? You are everything. Even though I got all this stuff around me, even though I got, you know, 401k, all this stuff, man, which is fine. Like, dude, I just, I know it's anything good in my life is coming from you. And here's what's, what's interesting is even for the non-believer who lives in this country, and is experiencing the, the, you know, the, the blessing of, you know, the prosperity of America. Like, I believe that, that that's because of the Lord. And so even the unbeliever, you know, as they're, they're trusting in all the wrong things, are experiencing the blessing of God. And so I just want to, us to, to think about this a little bit today, because how many of you guys want to, you know, experience, you, you read and Jesus says, man, you're going to go out and you're going to do greater works than these. Right? Like, come on. He said that. And, and, and he, he told, and I'm going to read this in a minute, but he told the, his disciples to make disciples who do what they did. So the, the message of greater works isn't just for these guys. It's for the church as a whole. And I want, I want to see that. But I know that if I'm, like, struggling with even believing God for my provision, there's a, there's a couple things that are really, really sad that are happening there. Number one, like I'm not honoring my father. And, and because I'm not, and, and because I'm putting my, my trust in worldly, you know, provision and strategies and whatever it might be, I'm actually, um, a lot of times I'm living in fear because I'm afraid. You know, I'm afraid that these things, if they fail, that I'm just, I'm done for. You know, we look at the economy today and talk of recession and, you know, all these different things. And, and, and I'm not saying it's, it's not true. I, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see the, the season that we step into. I hear, but here's what I know. For those who belong to the Father, like, you don't have any reason to be afraid. The scripture literally says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Literally talking about your provision. So it, it, when, we, when we 
our, when we don't realize that, when we don't step into that reality with God, it's sad because we, we have all this energy going out to the wrong things, and a lot of time it's fearful or it's full of anxiety, and we don't ever get around to doing the greater works because we are so inwardly focused and afraid that, that we don't even have time for greater works. But if we were able to just trust God completely, that no matter what I have, no matter what I think I don't have, you know, and remember there's a difference between wants and needs. I heard a guy say, if you want something bad enough, it becomes a need. So some of our needs, you know, they might just be wants. I get that. I have wants too. I'm not even trying to say it's a bad thing. I'm just saying, like, we, if, if we can realize, like, we literally all have what we need. The fact that you're alive today Seriously, the fact that you're alive today means, tells me that God has been providing for you your entire life. Right? Even the breath that I'm taking right now, I mean, who created the air? <laughs> you know, I'm breathing in God's provision. And so I would just like to suggest that, it, that if we could just step into this, this just a little bit, change on our perception that it, it would not only free us up to do step into greater works but it would also allow us to live in in with a peace you know the the scripture talks about that you know these believers these jesus people will have a peace that the world doesn't understand and it's like why well that's because man we fully trust our god that he is king that he loves us that we're his kids that he's gonna show up for us he's a good father that his goodness is even better than we think it is right this is why we're able to you know look out and see you know talk of recession or whatever it is you know on the news the, the latest fear they're trying to sell us today and we can say you know what i'm not afraid i'm not afraid and then what happens i'm actually my faith is, is building. I have a baseline of faith that's, that's really healthy. I'm already believing for greater things in my life. And now it's actually, because I have this new baseline, I'm able to work from this baseline. And, I, and now I can go to the next level. And I can start to believe that, that my life, you know, that God can use my life to impact yours. Now I, I, I'm not worried about all this anymore. And now I can, I, can, I, can, I can minister to you. And isn't that, isn't that where we want to get is to the place where we're, we're less worried about this and, and we're, more, we're more focused on this? Loving each other well. There's a, a scripture in, in Deuteronomy, and I'm going to read it. It's, it's De Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8, and I, I love this. It says, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or in dread of them, for the Lord your God is the one who's going with you. He will not desert you or abandon you. I just, I just love that. Like, God is not going to desert you <laughs> or me or abandon us. He's not going to show up. You know, he's not too busy for you or me. He's not, he's not interested in, in, in just like, he's not like those birds, you know, that like kick their babies out of the nest and just like, hey, fly or die, you know, like, he, you know what I mean? <laughs> Is that, those are true. That happens, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, and I get it. There's some, like, there's some, you know, the, God created that. But, you know, it's like he, he's, he wants to, to participate in this life with us. And so, anyway, I, I just want to, to raise the, the faith a little bit because I think that even in a prosperous nation, we can live in a way where we know it's like it's all him we don't have to wait till that day that i'm at rock bottom to you know turn my life fully to the lord because isn't that the kind of what happens we get in a tight spot and then we're like i'm all yours you know, anything if you just get me out of this one he's like and he does and that's the love of the father right he does and that's so crazy because he knows he's like I, okay i'm gonna do it again you got yourself in a mess you know what? I'm freely giving you what you need to get you out of here because he loves us so much. And then what happens? We, we start to stray. And we start to put our trust in all the wrong stuff again. And we get in a tight spot. And we, you know, it's just like this cycle that happens. I don't think that it has to stay that way. I think that we can, we can cultivate within ourselves a greater level of faith just, just from the start. 
Um, we can put on a, you know, a kingdom mindset, that, a mindset where my provision, my mission, my impact is all from the Father. Man, it's all from the Father. It's all from him. You know, he's in a lot more control than we think he is. You know, we have so many testimonies. I'm not going to even get into them, but you have testimonies recently of asking the Father for something. And I will share it, you know, buying a house. And it was, hey, could you take $100,000 out off this house? And next thing you know, $100,000 comes off the house, and you bought the house. You know, and it's like, you just, come on, man. Like, you think about it, and you think about the testimony of what God has done for you. And sometimes it's like, it's, it's above just what you need, it's what you want. And so I'm just saying, like, we can do this. We can put on a kingdom mindset that says everything, man, I'm engaging with the kingdom, man. It's all about the kingdom. That's what it is, you know. I, and I serve the king. Not only do I serve the king, but I'm his kid. So that gives me even more access to the kingdom. I can stop freaking out, man. I can stop having anxiety. I can find contentment where I'm at today, knowing that God has plans and purposes for my life that are not to harm me, but they're for good. And if I can just live that way, I really believe that that is going to be the, the secret for me to then start to, to focus outward and pursue the greater work. So I'm going to bring my, my dad up here, and I'm going to ask him a, a, a few questions and the reason I am is, is I said I was going to bring up that, you know, that, that scripture in uh, Matthew. It says, and that was in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Some people call us the Great Commission. You can bring them up. and Yeah, let's bring them up. And it says, uh, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of an age. So the, the life of a disciple really is, is doing all that he commanded his disciples to do. And so anyway, I'm, I had my dad come in today. Is this close enough? This is close enough, yeah. Okay. We don't want to be too close. That'd be weird. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I had my dad come in today because I, you know, I've shared with you guys a lot when it comes to, um, oh, okay. yeah, is it on? It's in the. Ethan, can you try to? Is it on? I can. I can hear myself. There you go. There we yeah. go. Oh, uh, there we go. Beautiful. So I asked my dad to come in here today because my dad has a lot of experience with seeing miracles and devils cast out and you know all kinds of stuff. And like I've shared with you guys before, when it comes to different topics within you know like you know the the Bible or, or church or with God. I always like to go and hear from the people who have experience in it. There's a lot of people out there that I find talk about a lot of topics that they don't actually pursue or have experience in it. And it kind of bums me out because I'm like, yeah, but have you tried it? And they're like, no, I just, I studied it. It's like, okay, well, there's a difference between applying something, experience it, and just having knowledge of something, right? And so I just always admire my dad because my dad, I know, has seen so many miracles, and, and he loves the Lord completely. He's one of the most, in, you know, integral people I know, or integrous, what's that word? Yeah, integrous people I know. You know, he doesn't even sneak candy into movie theaters, and you know what I mean? Like, okay, maybe I have once. <laughs> well, actually, my, my wife did it, and I partaked of it. <laughs> yeah, what's that? So, I didn't really do it. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So he's not as good as I thought he was, but he's pretty good. But I, you know, I, I, I trust his input completely, and I just want to raise our faith to remember that all this stuff is real. So, okay, so the first question I want to ask you, Dad, is how many miracles have you seen, and is there one that stands out the most? Yeah, how many miracles? Hundred. I've seen hundreds of miracles. You know, over the years, uh, I didn't get to see all these, but I went to um, Brazil with Randy Clark, and we ministered in this huge church down there for a week, and I think there were somewhere between three and 5,000 people that got healed. Wow. So I didn't get to see each one of those. Um, so one of the, the greatest, Holy Spirit, what, what do you, which story do you want me to tell? Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, we were in Mexico and, um, you know, even to go to Mexico, you know, as you were 
telling your story or, or reading the scripture, you know, where he sent out the 12, you know, don't take anything with you. I was reminded of when the Lord called us to Mexico, we didn't speak Spanish. We had ne neither one of us had ever even been on a short term mission trip. We had no idea what missionaries did. <laughs> and we had no money to go. <laughs> so he hasn't changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I really think, you know, faith, it, faith is like a muscle. You got to use it. And as you use it, it grows, you know. And I was just sitting here thinking during your message, man, one of the prayers I need to be praying more often is, Lord, let me do something today that will actually stretch my faith so that my faith can grow. That's good. You know, because it is like that muscle thing, you know. And uh, so anyway, one of the, the most amazing miracles that I think I've seen, uh, somebody brought this young man to me when we were down in Mexico, and uh, he was wearing a dress in high heels. And uh, he actually wanted to stop drinking. So they brought him to me and said, would you pray for him to st stop drinking? Well, I'm thinking, yeah, but there may be some other things you need prayer for, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's my thought process. <laughs> but I said, well, yeah, I would do that. I said, but in order for you to be able to walk that out, you really need the Holy Spirit within you. And so would you like to receive Jesus? Because when you receive Christ in your life, you're born again of the Spirit, and His Spirit lives in you. And he said, okay. So he prayed to receive Christ. And then I said, well, could I pray that he would now renew your mind? And he's like, okay. So I prayed that the Lord would renew his mind. And when I got done praying, he looked at himself and he says, I look ridiculous, don't I? Wow. I said, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the thing, the other piece of this, he had been on female hormones for 15 years. So then I, I asked him, oh, and he said, do you have some men's clothes that I could wear? Wow. I said, yeah, I do. And then I asked him, can we ask the father to reverse the, the effects of 15 years of female hormones? He's like, sure. So I prayed for him, and, and uh, when I got done praying for him, he, he's going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm like, what? <laughs> he says, look at my feet. Well, he was wearing women's high heels shoes, and when he came in, his feet fit those shoes perfectly. Now his toes were a couple inches over the Whoa. end of the high heels. So Whoa. the place where the female hormones had restricted him from growing was reversed, and his feet actually grew. And, you know, I'm sure there were other changes too, but that was the most visible one in the moment. And he left that day wearing my clothes. Wow. So that was a pretty amazing miracle. That's an awesome miracle. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, to see something that obvious that quick was just stunning. Yeah, and it's cool that the Lord still had, you know, it's like a great testimony of like that even the stuff that we can do to ourselves, that God still has compassion. Had compassion, yeah, because yeah, he repented and, and yeah. you know, God in his grace and mercy reversed the effects. Yeah, wow. It was beautiful. Thanks. That was, yeah, that was a great testimony. Okay, so the next question is, how many times have you been part of casting out a demon, and does one story stand out? Yeah, um, how many times? A uh, hundred times, maybe? Probably at least. Um, yeah, and one story. Actually, I have a few that stand out. Go ahead. Can I just tell? I'll just sure. tell them super quick, because the first one that I ever got to cast out, I had no idea what it even looked like to cast out a demon somebody manifested in my, my pickup we were praying and this manifestation happened this guy was like 300 pounds and I knew that I had a choice and it was my pickup I could run but then he's still in my pickup <laughs> or, or, or I could or I could act like I actually knew what I was doing <laughs> And I chose the latter inside. It, honestly, I was really pretty scared. But, it, you know, I had heard some missionary stories or something over the years, so I decided I'm going to just act like I'm confident. So I did, and, you know, I told this thing to leave him, 
and there was manifestations, his chest started heaving, and all of a sudden he was set free. That was the yes, first sir. time that I ever experienced anything like that. Um, I'm trying to think. One of, one of the things, there's two of them that I'm thinking of. Well, one time down in Mexico, a pastor and his associate showed up at my house and said, Pastor, would you help us do something? I'm like, yeah, what do you need help with? Well, we need help casting out a demon. And I said, oh, okay, well, where is this person? Well, it's a girl, and she's at our church in the sanctuary, and we have her tied up with ropes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, oh Holy my God. cow, what? <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah, for so the record, know, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> so we went over there, and I, I asked her, I said, why are you tied up with ropes? <laughs> She said, I don't know, ask them. Anyway, long story short, you know, we just, I took her through a process of repenting. You know, there was a lot of really crazy stuff that she had opened her life up to over the years, you know. And I just took her through this process of repenting, and then we would just tell the demon associated with those things to be gone. And, you know, there were some manifestations and some coughing and, and things like that that took place. But the other one that's that I wanted to share, if I could, because oh, we got time. Yeah, you're good. This was really amazing to me. Um, uh, we had this couple in our church, Patty and Cesar, and they invited somebody to come to our Wednesday night service. This is down in Mexico as well, and there was a a guy there, and he received the Lord that night. Well, after the the church service, he came up to me and he said, "Pastor, would you pray for me? I've been sick." I went, "Sure." And I, honestly, I didn't even ask him what he was sick from. I thought maybe he had a cold or flu or something. I didn't know. And it was pr I think it was Holy Spirit that didn't let me know yeah. what he was sick from because maybe I wouldn't have the faith that I had. Yeah. So I got ready to pray for him. And I, I probably took out some oil. You know, the Bible in James 5 talks about anointing with oil. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick, it says. And so I took out some oil and I anointed his forehead. And as I did, I heard Holy Spirit say, cast out the spirit of infirmity. So, you know, we, the Bible talks about a spirit of infirmity. You know, I'm not saying that all sickness is connected to a spirit, but some is. So I'm like, spirit of infirmity, release him and go in Jesus' name. Instantly, he hit the ground and he coughed about three or four times. <laughs> And I thought, dude, he must have been sick. <laughs> you know, is what I'm thinking. Apparently, he just coughed something out. You know, I couldn't oh. see it. But I knew something happened there. So he started coming to our church. Six months later, he was actually helping me with a, a project. And he said, well, you, you remember, Pastor, when you prayed for me because I had been sick? I went, oh, yeah. He said, well, I actually had leukemia. Whoa. I was living in Canada, and I got leukemia, went to the doctors, got diagnosed, and they said, you need to go back to Mexico and tell your family goodbye. There's nothing we can do for you. And they gave him about six months to live. And um, he's still alive today. That's been years. You know, or at least the last time I checked, he was still alive. It's been a while since I've had contact with him. But in a moment, that spirit of infirmity had to leave him. And, wow. and I think part of it, in my opinion, that was so powerful is he had just given his life to Jesus. Wow. You know, he had surrendered everything to Jesus in that moment. He was ready to be delivered. Yeah. You know, and actually the word sozo in the New Testament that we, you know, is translated salvation a lot of places really means saved, healed, and delivered. You know, that that's available you know, when we surrender our life to Jesus, it's amazing. So, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So I have a, a, let me, a question that I didn't plan. Um, how do you deal with um, not losing faith when you don't see a miracle? You know, I just, I deal with it in the fact I just go, you know, Lord, I know that there's things that I don't know yet. You know, there's things that I don't understand yet, but I believe the word. I believe what you say. I've seen miracles. I don't understand why this one didn't happen. Yeah. But, Father, I choose to live in faith with, with what you say is true rather than in doubt with what I haven't seen yet. You know, yeah. the, the Bible says that the righteous shall live by faith and not by sight. Yeah. 
And so, you know, I go back. For me personally, if there's a, a moment I pray for somebody, they don't get healed or whatever, I go back to the word and I go back to the testimonies that I know. I've seen the things I've seen. There's stuff going on in the spirit realm we don't understand. You know, one day, you know, maybe the Lord will explain it all to us. But we live in a fallen world. And I know that spiritual forces are legalist. And if there's a legal right for them to stay, they will. And, you know, so it's warfare. That's actually what Paul said, you know. You know, our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against powers, rulers, authorities, and spiritual forces in heavenly places. And we don't understand it all. You know, we just are a people that live by faith. And, you know, even, I mean, the crazy thing is Jesus goes back to his hometown. And he says, it says that he could do no miracles, only heal a few people because of their, their lack of faith. And the, also their, their lack of honor towards him. So there, there, there's things in the spirit realm that we don't understand. And, you know, we have a choice. When something doesn't happen the way we think it shouldn't, we can quit. Or we can pursue. You know, the, the picture of the persistent widow. You know, Jesus tells the story of the persistent widow coming before an unjust God. Or an unjust judge. And her persistence actually breaks his will, and he chooses to honor her, you know. And then Jesus says, I wonder when the Son of Man returns to earth if you'll find faith. See, faith and persistence are connected. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, that does help. And could you, but could you explain for anybody who doesn't know when you, what you talk about, the, the legal um, right? Yeah. For instance, here's one. The Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. So there is, in other words, there's power in our words, right? So if we have, and also Jesus said, you know, with the same tongue, you can bless or you can curse, right? So here's what a blessing is. A blessing releases the kingdom of heaven. A curse releases the kingdom of hell or darkness. So, so if we declare a matter with our mouths and we say, and I don't even like saying it, <laughs> you know, but if we say something really bad about ourselves, we actually open up opportunities for the enemy to come against us. There's, the enemy's power comes from us coming into agreement with that. You know, it's like I told you, the girl who was tied in ropes, she had all these demonic entities that were a part of her life, not because she was a sweet girl that never opened up a door. She opened up plenty of doors. She was a drug addict. She was a prostitute. And there were many other things that were going on in her life. So she opened up those doors. And so when she opened the doors to those things, there was a legal right for those spiritual forces to be there because she, basically she had invited them to be there. You know, not knowingly, but unknowingly. Does that make sense? Does yeah. So yeah. So explain how you deal with that, though. Um, how does how, how do you deal with it? You, you re repent first. Repent is the changing of your mind. You ask for forgiveness, and then you renounce those spirits and you command them to go. You see, I've seen like like for instance, this girl they tied up in ropes. Well, they were trying to cast out a demon, and she had never engaged her will in that. So I just went in and I began to let her engage her will and repent for what she had done and renounce the spirits behind it. And when she started, you know, doing that, all of a sudden there wasn't such a battle. I mean, there was some manifestations, the little ones, you know, but it was nothing like whatever these pastors, I don't even know what they did. You know, God has given each one of us a free will, right? You know, who, who am I to try to cast that out a demon that somebody's invited in. I need to really have them repent and decide they don't want that any longer. And a lot of times the demonic is, is um, connected to a lie. For instance, uh, I was praying with a gal one time, and she had an abusive husband, 
And this spirit of deception had gotten this huge hold on her. And as I'm praying, this spirit of deception said, I'm her protector. So she had believed this lie that the only way she could be protected from her husband is to lie. So she had made this agreement with deception. Oh, crazy. And she had put deception in a place of being her protection. And so she wasn't willing to get rid of that because that thing was her protector. Now, she eventually did. But does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Oh, well, great input on that. I just, yeah, I wanted to ask a couple more questions because it all raise, you know, it raises questions, you know, like, how does this stuff work? And if you guys have any other questions, anybody, like, you know, hit, hit my dad up um, this morning before he leaves or get his email address or something like that. Yeah. It's always good to ask people that have a lot of experience and in, um, in those areas, because otherwise it's just really kind of hard to know what you don't know. Yeah. Okay, so here's a big question. I think this is an important one. How is the experience? Because at some point in your life, you didn't experience this stuff, and then at some point, you did, right? Yeah. So how has experiencing these things changed your outlook or approach to how we are supposed to live as believers today? Um, yeah, I, I look at it everything different than I used to. It's interesting. A long time ago, I heard somebody teach on the difference between the Greek mindset and other mindsets, you know, like the, the mindset from the Israelites and stuff. The Greek mindset is this thought process that there's two realms that are completely um, not connected. There's the physical realm and the spiritual realm. Most of the world doesn't see it that way. Most of the world sees it as the two are intertwined. So I think for me that there is a, um, as I live out this life, understanding that everything around me, the spirit realm's happening all the time. There's, oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. So I was home from the mission field. We were at a Christmas party, and, and there was this gal there, and I had told her a, a couple of uh, testimonies of some things that Jesus had done, and and she looked at me, and the older gal, she said, something weird's happening right now. She goes, I feel like crying, and I don't cry. And I said, well, the Holy Spirit is coming on you to draw you to Jesus. And I, I said, would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She said, yeah, I would like to, but there's just something that always keeps me from doing that. Well, instantly, I recognized that that something was a spirit, right? Yeah. See, if we live in the knowledge of there are spiritual forces impacting us, I had, I had an opportunity to do something about it. I said, could I just pray for you for a second? She goes, okay. I honestly, I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, whatever it is that's keeping her from receiving Christ, I silence you right now in Jesus' name. And I said, would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She said, yes, I would. <laughs> and she prayed to receive Christ in that moment. So... <laughs> Everywhere I go, I understand that I impact the spiritual realm around me. I know that that's the case. And I will walk into a place, and if I'm f feeling something evil, I just release the kingdom of heaven. You know, I there's actually angels that are, you know, it says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve us. So I know that angels go with us, and I know there's a, an availability of angels. So I ask the Father, Lord, would you just send this spirit into this atmosphere? You see, sometimes we, we go into an atmosphere and we just complain because, oh, man, they're the, you know. Well, why don't we just ask the Father to release the opposite? You know, if these people are mean, I just go, I go into an atmosphere, I just release love into this atmosphere. I just declare love. I just, you know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. So I utilize what I've been given now because I really understand that there's a spirit realm all around us and that I can actually impact that spirit realm. And so I, I live life as a son. Yeah. Who, Jesus, uh, Paul said, you know, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in your mortal bodies. So the question is, how do we get that power out? 
you know? So I choose to impact every place I go because I know who lives in me. And I know the power of my words because of who lives in me. So I, that's, that, does, I hope that helps. Yeah, no, that, I, I think that is huge. So my, here's potentially my last question, but what would you say is the biggest piece of advice or, and encouragement you could give someone who is wanting to step out and start believing God for miracles? There's a saying at uh, Bethel Church in Reading or BSSM, which is Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Find ways to take risk. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, in fact, you just re reactivated that for me this morning. Thank you for that great message. But it's, it's like finding those opportunities to take risk with the Father. You know, I've been places before, where I just hear the Lord saying, you know, take a risk. Don't even know what you're going to say before you get up on the stage. <laughs> I've done that a lot of times. Walk up and go, okay, Lord, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to speak through me? Yeah. Because I just know how important faith is. And if I can grow my faith,
very good place in life. Yeah. You know, he's looking for a willing heart. You know, we should know the, the word. We should study the word. Well, let me, let me tell you just one more story really quick. Because the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, and I think it's in 2.24, but I could be wrong about that. He says a very interesting thing. He says, I don't come to you with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the power of the Spirit, so that your faith does not rest on men's wisdom, but upon the power of God. That's a good word. You know, even Paul wasn't about talking somebody into the kingdom. He was about showing them. Let me show you how real God is. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So what I hear you saying is that anybody today could start stepping out and taking that risk. Yeah. I mean, the, the key is intimacy with Jesus. I, I read this morning, you know, where Jesus said, and I think it's in um, John 15, says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do no good works. Yeah, that's the word. And, and it actually uh, says in that context, too, that it's for the Father's glory that we do good works. You know, and, and in that context, he's actually talking about spiritual works. You know, he's talking about supernatural things. And it all comes from a connection with Jesus. Yeah. You know, if you're living in blatant sin, don't prophesy. Okay, because it's probably going to be tainted. But if you know Jesus and you have the right heart, you know, the key to being used of the Father is ridiculous love. I tell people, if you want to hear from the Father for someone else, engage your heart towards that person and actually encounter the love that the Father has for them. And he will speak through you. Yeah, that's so yeah, good. I hope that helps. Yeah, no, that's good. All right, well, thanks, Dad. You're welcome. You guys, was that, was that cool? Yeah? All right. Well, before, we're going to bring Grace back up, and here's just what I want to leave you guys with today is the whole point of this is, is faith. It's, it's to, to start out in, number one, to create that, that baseline of faith in your life where, man, everything that I have, I, I live in thankfulness that God is my provider. My security is not found in any, I might, he might lead me to, you know, my retirement plan and stuff like that. That's fine. But my security isn't found in those things. It's found in God. And at the end of the day, if all those things disappeared, I still would feel secure because my faith is in him. And then as we do that, as we create, and, and that requires intimacy, right? Because you, you, can't, you can't really believe that if you're not willing to enter into an intimate connection with your God and believe that he cares for you. And uh, as we do that, you know, today, throughout the week, maybe ask yourself, is there any area in my life that, I'm, I, that I really, I, I'm not trusting God in, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, these systems or what the world has and, and really just ask the Father, spend some time in prayer asking God, are, are you my security in this area or is this thing? Find out what he says, right? Because I believe God can talk to you. And then the other thing too is as you develop this life of intimacy with God, like be open to what Holy Spirit is highlighting because Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. And so we got to be paying attention to asking God, like, what are you doing in this moment? Is there somebody that needs prayer? Is there somebody who's sick that God's like, go lay hands on this person and pray for healing? Um, is it, you know, it, it could be any of these things. Maybe you need to pray for somebody. I've literally had an encounter with, uh, you know, a, a kid prayed. We laid hands on him, and, and next thing you know, he was growling at us and stuff like that. And it was the same story. He ended up casting out a demon out of somebody, and I've never done it before. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, man, I'm just going to believe that, that God is superior, that he's bigger than this situation. Whatever the case may be, pay attention to what is God saying? How is he leading you? And, and step out in that. Because it's really cool that the scripture says to seek first the kingdom. He's like, check it out. I'm going to take care of your provision, your security, all that stuff. I just want you to do kingdom stuff. You do that, I'm going to take care, take care of the rest. Don't hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying go quit your jobs or anything like that. Unless God tells you to. But 
be responsible, do your stuff, but trust that even your job is provision from the Lord. Like, give Him credit. Give Him the glory. Sound good? And see what the Lord will do. So, God, we're, we, we thank you for, um, God, that you have brought us in to a family, a kingdom family, God, that you call us sons and daughters. And, God, I just ask that you, um, you, you help us this morning to just believe that and receive that. To know that we are we're part of uh, the the most royal family. It's interesting on the news. There's all this royal family stuff, and, and and it's like, yeah, okay. There's there's kings and queens on earth, but man, we 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 have a, a king in heaven that is so much bigger, better than any of that stuff, and we're all part of that family. We're all princes and princesses, and, and we're, we're kingdom kids. And so, Father God, I just ask this morning that you just solidify that in our hearts, that, that, that we belong to you, that we are part of your family, that our security is found in our dad, our security is found in our father who's better than we think. And God, we just uh, give you permission to start highlighting opportunities to, to bring the kingdom into to dark situations. So we thank you for what you're going to do.